And so the mystery remains. Where is Daniel? After the airbags came out, somebody turned that ignition over at least 46 more times. That's not normal. On the 23rd of June, 2021, Daniel Robinson, a 24-year-old geologist, turned up to his work site in a remote area of the Arizona desert. After only 15 minutes on site, he hopped back into his Jeep, waved goodbye, and drove off. It took a month to recover his vehicle, crashed and abandoned a few miles away. There was no sign of Daniel, save all his personal belongings, including all of his clothing scattered around the vehicle, one red boot sized 11 and a half wedged under the Jeep. So what happened to Daniel? Police investigators proposed that something triggered him to drive out into the desert, crash his Jeep, strip off all his clothing, and wander off. The young, healthy, fun-loving, recent university graduate, who never went more than six hours at a time out of contact with his family and friends, simply vanished. Today we are taking a look at the open case of Daniel Robinson, whose family, alongside a mass of volunteers, are out in the desert every week, still searching. Daniel is the youngest of four children. He grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. Daniel is a keen outdoorsman, a musician, and a traveler who has always been close with his family and remained in constant contact with his parents and siblings. Daniel was born without part of his arm and one hand. His father, David, said that Daniel was never the type to let his handicap slow him down. He taught himself trombone and the French horn. He was the center of his social group and has many close friends. When Daniel went off to college, he set his mind on becoming a geologist, and that is exactly what he did. In 2019, Daniel graduated from the College of Charleston with a major in archaeology. He then attended a course in Tucson. He remained in Arizona and soon after was offered a job by the engineering firm Matrix New World, working as a geologist. A worksite in the Arizona desert was being prepared as a potential site that builders were hoping to develop. So it was on the 23rd of June, 2021, that Daniel set out to the work area, which was roughly 50 miles southwest of Phoenix. He arrived at 9.30 a.m. where he met with his co-worker, Ken Elliott, with whom he had never previously met. It was an abnormally cool and rainy day for the area. They were to work on a deep well. Ken said that initially Daniel seemed fine. They spoke about the weather, given how cold it was, and briefly discussed the job. But after a brief period, Daniel became distant and distracted. Ken reported seeing a very, very distant look in his eyes, and he was staring off into the desert. Ken's first thought was that it was drugs, but then he noted that Daniel's pupils were not dilated and he seemed physically fine and saw no other indications that drugs were at work, so he discounted this. His second thought was that perhaps Daniel had some kind of medical condition. Ken reported that Daniel was making statements that didn't make a lot of sense. He was replying with answers that had nothing to do with the questions being asked. At one point, he asked whether Ken wanted to go back with him to Phoenix to rest. He was watching his co-worker with interest when, after only about 15 minutes, Daniel walked back toward his Jeep. Assuming that he was retrieving something from it, Ken did not say anything. But at that point, Daniel got inside the driver's side, did up his seatbelt, then looked back at Ken, waved goodbye, and drove off. Ken continued working for a time. He contacted other co-workers about the situation, but was proceeding with the assumption that Daniel simply had not been feeling well and had gone home to rest. He would call in sick when he got there. But by 3 p.m., he was made aware that no one had been able to reach Daniel. His family and friends had been calling and texting with no response, which was extremely uncharacteristic. At that point, Ken decides he should trace Daniel's movements and follows the Jeep's tracks out of the worksite. The rain-soaked roads left the track clear for Ken to see. He made it to a T-junction where one would turn if heading towards Phoenix, but Ken finds that Daniel's track headed the other way, west, into what he described as an extremely large desert area. Ken followed the tracks and started searching the desert. His co-worker was not the only individual to report bizarre and unusual behavior from Daniel. According to the police report, multiple of Daniel's friends and family members and a waitress at a Waffle House he visited two days before he disappeared reported odd behavior leading up to his disappearance. Most commonly, he was described as being off. On the same day, he had texted his sister that he had an emergency, but then neglected to answer any of her calls in response. His sister also said one time he went over to her apartment and sat in silence for 30 minutes before just getting up and leaving. His father, David, also reported to police that Daniel had said that he had met a woman and was in love with her. 
David found this strange because his son didn't appear to know anything about the woman. Hearing from his daughter that Daniel could not be located and unable to reach him himself, David promptly relocated from the East Coast to Buckeye, Arizona. A war veteran with two tours in Afghanistan under his belt, David approached the search for his son as a mission that would be pursued unfailingly until its conclusion. He requested helicopter searches of the area and all possible resources of the Buckeye Police Department be deployed urgently. His son was missing in the desert and there was no time to waste. Um, I requested him to go out to look for my son. Uh, they told me, of course, he's a grown man. So, um, and it was at night also, so they couldn't go out. Um, the next morning, I asked them the same question. Hey, can y'all please go out there and look for my son? Um, the officer crew told me that they were going to um, go out there, but then he called me back an hour or so later and say it's been denied from the higher ups because he's a grown man and um, um, he has the right to leave if he wants to. Um, from that point, I have Auntie and uh, Philly who called, and I don't know what she said to them, but hey, she, she can't call me back and say, hey, they're going to send the firebird out from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And that was the first search. But by that time, um, as soon as they told me the first time they were going out for my son, I was in my car already heading to Phoenix. Uh, by the time I got to Phoenix, that's when they was out on the 26th. The initial search was led by Buckeye Police Department using UTVs, cadaver dogs, searchers on foot, and drones flying overhead along with assistance in the air from Phoenix Firebird helicopters and Civil Air Patrol. While police were dispatched to check Daniel's apartment on June 24th, the day after the disappearance, they did not go inside. Police did not actually enter Daniel's home until July 7th, nearly two weeks after he was reported missing. Civil Air Patrol, which is comprised of volunteers who do air searches, were also not contacted by police until July 7th. Helicopter and drone searches failed to find his slate blue Jeep Renegade. Detectives said they obtained a ping from Daniel's phone, but were unable to track it due to the phone being turned off or out of range. After obtaining call records, they learned that he has not made any calls or texts after leaving the job site. Finally, on July 19th, almost a month after Daniel disappeared, a ranger called Brandon Shelton found his 2017 Jeep Renegade in a ravine. It was just four miles from the work site where he was last seen, but Daniel was not with the vehicle. The Jeep had landed on its side with significant damage. Police said a seatbelt had been worn at the time and the airbags were found deployed. One of Daniel's size 11 and a half Red Wing work boots was stuck under the truck. Next to the Jeep were Daniel's clothes. Also his wallet, phone, keys, and a bottle of water were inside the vehicle. A t-shirt, jeans turned inside out, shorts, orange work vest, boots, and two mismatched black socks were all located. One of the socks was Nike, the other an Adidas. The area where the Jeep was found had been searched by helicopter weeks prior. Shelton, the ranger who discovered the Jeep, has cattle that graze 14,000 acres in the Buckeye area. He is convinced the car had only been there a short while when he came across it, saying, It was clean, and my cows would have found it. Cows are inquisitive creatures and would have licked it. The Jeep was found in an area that had already been searched, with police saying because of the rough terrain, the vehicle was not clearly visible to crew searching by air and foot. After discovery of the Jeep, the region was combed through extensively for any additional signs of Daniel. Robots were sent down old mines in the area, returning nothing of interest. There was no blood found in the car, and according to police, there were no indications of foul play. David is not convinced that enough was being done in the search effort and taken matters into his own hands. He points to the approach of investigators towards the discovered Jeep, for instance. As opposed to retaining Daniel's clothing and other personal items recovered at the scene as potential evidence of a crime, they instead promptly returned these items to David, categorized as retained for safekeeping, but not as evidence. In the initial months following Daniel's disappearance, he organized a wealth of volunteers to gather for systematic weekly searches of the surrounding desert in a hope to rescue his son. On one such search, a single Nike sock matching the one found with the Jeep was located three miles further away. He cannot explain it, but feels that it is one more indication that there is far more to this story than the official police narrative. To add to the oddities, David logged into Daniel's social media accounts to find that all of the photos in his son's Instagram account had been deleted after his disappearance. So David pushed further and hired a private investigator. Jeff McGrath is an ex-police officer and specializes in accident investigations. McGrath analyzed the data from the Jeep's black box to piece together a picture of what happened in the minutes and seconds leading up to the crash. What he finds does not fit nicely into a sensible narrative. It's confusing. 
Based on GPS data, he discovered that the Jeep had got into multiple accidents before it fell down the ravine. Evidence from the vehicle showed that it crashed, the airbags deployed, then drove another 11 miles and was involved in another crash. The first collision was four hours after Daniel went missing, while there was also some paint transfer from the vehicle. After that first accident, it's unknown where the vehicle was taken next. McGrath said that after the airbags were deployed, the ignition was turned over at least 46 more times and an extra 11 miles were driven. The police assessment compiled by a private consultant long after investigators determined there was no foul play found that the Jeep was accelerating rapidly in the moments before impact. They posited that the driver was attempting to jump the 20-foot ravine. McGrath says this is complete nonsense. How does this differ? Well, Why? I don't think my data is different than theirs. Um, this this um, reconstruction outfit, um, they reviewed the same document I did. They have the same document I do. It's the download from the vehicle's black box. Uh, it's called the crash data report. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the same data. Where he got the vehicle sped up at the end, I have no idea. Uh, and, and when you do a reconstruction of a collision, you not only do you view the reports that the vehicle creates when you download that, but you also need to review the, the physical evidence, meaning the vehicle. And I have possession of this vehicle and nobody's asked me to come take a look at it. You, you need to do the two together. But, um, um, but, but for him to review the same document that I have possession of, and, and, and he does now too, uh, and say the vehicle sped up at the end or tried to jump the ravine is, is, is ludicrous. I, I don't have any evidence of that and nothing in the vehicle's uh, data from five seconds prior to those airbags coming out. Anything uh, else that this, that. anything else? That While the Buckeye Police Department's explanation of the crash remains in dispute, they have also suggested an explanation for why they believe Daniel was acting so odd. The explanation's name is Caitlin. Caitlin, whose last name has been redacted in the reports, met Daniel in his capacity as a delivery driver for Instacart, a second job that Daniel maintained in addition to his work for Matrix. He turned up at her home in Phoenix to deliver some alcohol one evening and was invited inside to hang out with her and her friend. At that point, they exchanged phone numbers. Caitlin said she and her female friend were drunk and that looking back on it, she shouldn't have invited a stranger into her home. She added that she thought he was harmless as he only had one arm and was short in height. She insisted that nothing happened between the two of them beyond exchanging phone numbers. Their text exchanges do offer a small glimpse into Daniel's state of mind. Within a week, Daniel had visited Caitlin at her apartment uninvited. Following this, he texted, I couldn't stop thinking about you. By June 20th, his message was, I love you. She tried to rebuff him. Caitlin replied, Honestly, you showing up at my house unannounced may be extremely uncomfortable, and I don't see us hanging out together anytime soon. The next day, he turned up at her house again. After this incident, she said, This isn't normal nor acceptable. If someone has expressed that you've made them uncomfortable, you need to back off. Do you hate me? Daniel replied. I don't hate you, but please leave me alone, Caitlin texted back. Daniel took some time, about 15 hours, before he responded. In a cryptic goodbye message, he wrote, The world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can, or we can, whatever, to name it. Followed by, I'll either see you again, or never see you again. This last message was sent 18 hours before Daniel's 9.30 a.m. shift in the desert. Theories about what could have happened to Daniel and where he may be today have been as prevalent as they are varied. Is that, um, you know, his theory is that um, my son may have had a se severe head injury. Um, that explains why he probably shredded all his clothing off. Uh, he also told me that um, um, he also believed that my son walked in, in the, um, out, out in the desert undressed um, because he wanted to be away from his family and um, his friends, and he, he most likely wanted to go join the monastery and become a monk. Um, that's the only theory I got from any um, anyone in the police, uh, Buckeye Police Department. Investigator telling us Daniel had told co-workers he was tired before leaving work. So one theory is that he stopped somewhere along the desert road to take a nap and was the victim of a carjacking, then left in the desert after the crash. Or the possibility of a drug, like PCP, being involved. And that would cause uh, inhibitions to go away, possible risky behavior. He may have hit his head in, in an accident, had some trauma, some brain trauma, some swelling of the brain that would disorient, uh, couldn't find his way out, or laid down somewhere, passed out, and, and succumbed to his injuries. 
Most recently, McGrath has been on news programs suggesting that sightings of Daniel have been reported in Arizona leading into California. Nothing further has been confirmed on this front from about mid-October to researching this case now in December. While the independent effort led by David Robinson attempts to get on the same page as the police, the searches continue. And they are finding evidence, just not much that links back to Daniel. On July 31st, a human skull was found, but further investigations proved it was not Daniel and its identity remains unknown. According to the Please Help Us Find Daniel website, seven searches have returned the remains of about six different individuals. Volunteers have found human remains in the Buckeye Desert while searching for 24-year-old Daniel Robinson. Daniel's father leads the group and Buckeye police quickly confirm the remains do not belong to his son. It has been almost six full months now since the last confirmed sighting of Daniel by Kenneth Elliott out in the desert. David has now shifted his focus from exclusively searching in desert areas to also scoping nearby cities in case his son is perhaps lost amongst the homeless or in a medical or mental facility. Jeff McGrath has said that any sightings of Daniel in California in particular now would be beneficial and hopes to spread the word further in this area. Daniel was described as a 5'8 African-American man weighing 165 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Part of his right forearm and hand are missing as a result of a birth defect. If you have any news or would like to either donate to the search or directly volunteer, the Please Help Find Daniel website is linked below. A petition calling for greater funding and training of the Buckeye Police Department to better equip them in their efforts to find missing persons is also on the website. At the time of researching this case, it had over 98,000 signatures. Thank you all again for joining me here in the lounge. My name is Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. I might just go and stab him again, but... Alright, do not stab him again. So, okay. So, in total, how many times? Uh, three times. Three times, okay. Uh, once I thought I'd get his heart, well, he hasn't got one, and then twice in the abdomen.